Good morning. Welcome to St. John Hill Church. My name is Dave Bittler. I am the pastor here. If you're visiting with us this morning, I wish you a special welcome and thank you for worshiping with us today. Uh, I want to thank everybody who uh, came out yesterday uh, for the Keith Plot concert. If you missed it, probably going to have to wait at least another year. Um, but uh, it, uh, it was it was really good to see an old friend uh, and. Um, Everybody who was there looked at me and said, you got to have him back the next time he's in town. Uh, it is a 12-hour drive from South Carolina to here, uh, so um, we'll see when we can make that uh, happen again. Um, but again, thank you for everybody who helped with uh, refreshments and stuff and, and everybody who came. Uh, it was a great time. Uh, some announcements coming up uh, in just a couple of weeks is our turkey supper. Saturday, November 5th, uh, there is in your bulletin a uh, calendar of the events that will go on that week, and we need uh, help for that. Uh, you can see, where is the clipboard lady? Eileen's in the nursery. Eileen's in the nursery. Hi, Eileen. I know you can hear me in there. Uh, but she's got her clipboards, and uh, she would love to add your name uh, to her list if you're able to help. Also on October 29th, uh, we're going to be having a uh, family fun day at Wilcox Farms uh, at the Corn Maze. Um, if you'd like to join us for that, uh, we will cover your admission to the Corn Maze. Uh, but if you want anything beyond that, that, one's, uh, that will be uh, your responsibility. But we will uh, uh, cover your admission and hope that you will come out and, and join us for that. If the weather is bad that day. Uh, we will be meeting here at the church instead for a, a game night, so bring your favorite games if that happens, but we will make that uh, announcement uh, closer to the time. Here. Yes, and that's for, yes, for everybody who um, doesn't mind walking through, uh, you know, if, you, if you watched movies back in the 80s, you know, and corn mazes, you know, frighten you or anything, um, you can still come, and we'll make sure you get out alive. Uh, but, no, we're going to meet at the uh, at Wilcox Farms, which is just if you don't know where it is, Google it. Uh, I still uh, I still don't know. I know where it is. It's just it's down there a little bit. Um, you make a couple of turns, and it's right there on your left as you go out of town. Um, but uh, that's coming up on the 29th. And again, that is open for everybody. This is not just a, uh, uh, an event for the, the young or the young at heart. So, any other announcement? There's a consistory meeting right after worship today. So if you're on consistory, please uh, stick around for that. Any other announcements I need to make this morning? All right. Well, let's take a few moments as we prepare our hearts for worship and we hear the prelude. Thank you.
Would you stand for our call to worship, which comes from Psalm 121. I lift my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Would you join me in our opening hymn, Hallelujah, Praise Jehovah. It's number three in your hymnal. So the words will be on the wall behind me. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning that your glory may be exalted, that your name may be exalted far above the earth and sky for what you have done for us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Father, would you receive our worship and our praise 
this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As we come to a time of confession of sin, I'd ask that you would take your bulletin or follow on the wall behind me. As we pray together the unison prayer that is found there, following that we'll take a few moments in silent prayer to confess our own personal sins to the Lord. I'll then close us in prayer and offer us some words of assurance. Would you join me in the prayer of confession? Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let not hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Let's take a few moments in silent confession this morning. God of all grace, as we come before you pleading the blood of Jesus Christ to forgive our sins, to wash us and to make us clean. For the sake of your Son, would you hear our prayer? Would you forgive us, cleanse us and make us whole? We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear these words of assurance from Hebrews chapter 8. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. Let's sing together the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings This is the third Sunday of the month, and for a while that hasn't meant much in the ways of special things happening here, uh, but starting today and moving forward on the third Sunday of the month, uh, we, will, we are going to resume taking up our Joyful Noise offering. Uh, the Joyful Noise offering is so called uh, because what we're looking for you to give is your spare change. And uh, in just a minute, I'm going to invite our children to come up and uh, grab one of the containers up here, and they will be coming around. Uh, if you forgot this month, well, you can start saving for next month. But our Joyful Noise offering is an offering that goes to our Christian Ed Committee, which helps with uh, various ministries that they do in helping in the local community. So at this time, uh, if we have any children who would like to help, I would invite you to come up and... Uh, grab one of the containers that are here, um, 
and then make your way through the congregation when you are done. Please bring it right back up here and set it there when you are finished. And we'll give you guys a head start. And as they're coming around, I'll also invite our ushers to come forward so that we can take up our morning tithes and all. <laughs> Father, we thank you and praise you for all of the good gifts that come to us from your hand. Father, would you please accept these gifts, bless them to the work of your kingdom. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. I'd ask that you remain standing as we sing, uh, hear the call of the kingdom. If this is a new one for you, just pick it up as it comes by.
be seated. If you have your Bibles and would like to follow along, I invite you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. Today we will be focusing in on verse number 9 in our study of the Beatitudes. But as usual, I'm going to read verses 1 through 12 to put it into context. Let us hear the word of God. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. May God add his blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, as we come before your word this morning, would you be the light to our path? Would you illumine it for us and be our teacher so that we may better know you, better know Jesus Christ and the power of his salvation? We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Peace is an interesting thing, something that we generally wish we had more of in our lives. But Jesus putting this beatitude, this prophetic blessing where he does, is incredibly crucial. Because without this one here, Verses 10 through 12 won't make quite as much sense. That's my plug for you to come back next week and hear that part. But hopefully, if I do my job right today, those will make much more sense because they, there's going to be a turn that happens after this one. And it pivots on blessed are the peacemakers. Have you ever tried to be a peacemaker? Has it ever worked? See, here's the thing about being a peacemaker. Having a need for peace necessitates that there currently exists some kind of conflict. So it doesn't make any sense. I, this never, I said this in Sunday school this morning. So if you're not coming to Sunday school, you miss a lot of the good stuff that I talk about, what I'm going to talk about now, I talk about then. This never happens. I never get a married couple come to me and say, Pastor Dave, we need to talk. There's a problem. My wife and I are getting along. 
things are going well. We, you know, we're praying, we're, we're doing devotions together, you know, the, the, the kids are all well behaved, we've got our, you know, our finances are all in check, bills are getting paid, you know, life is good, you know, we're going on date nights two or three times a week, but we, I really need you to make peace between us. That never happens. That would be ludicrous, right? There would be no call for me to bring peace between two people who are living harmoniously together. So why is Jesus pronouncing a blessing on peacemakers? Well, if you've been following this series along, one of the things that I have tried to express is that what Jesus is blessing here is those who actually follow his example, his character. Because Jesus is perfectly the one who was poor in spirit. He did not press his own agenda. He mourned over the sin of his people. He was meek. He did not use his influence for his own uh, accord, but to seek the betterment of others. He was one who was hungry for the word of God, and that was his desire to the righteousness of God. He perfectly displayed mercy. He showed what it meant to be pure in heart, to be focused solely on the will of his Father. And he comes to be perfect peace maker. So the question is, where's the conflict? So if you're going to make peace, you have to know where the conflict resides. Right? If somebody wanted to make peace in Ukraine, it would not do much good to go to South Africa. That's not where the conflict is. So Jesus comes to be the, the perfect peacemaker to make peace where? Well, he's making peace between us and God. See, here's something that makes Christians very uncomfortable today. Is when I say, in our human nature, in our sinful nature, we are at war with God. And he is at war with us. Now, if you want to squirm in your seat for a second, that's fine. Because right? that's going to make some of you uncomfortable. One of the biggest lies that get told today, even from within the church, is this. God loves you just as you are. Wait, Pastor Dave, that's a lie? It's not the whole truth. See, we want, we want to tell people, oh, you know, God's, God's good with you. He's happy with you just as you are. Folks, have you ever read the book of Revelation? God's sitting in heaven getting ready to wage war on somebody. Who do you think that is? He's very unhappy with a, a group of people in the world right now. Right? He is not at peace with them. And yet we have ministers standing in the pulpit telling people all over the world, whether they have faith in Jesus Christ or not, God's God's not mad at you. He loves you. Go back and read the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah was called by God to bring a prophetic word to the people of Israel prior to these outside forces coming in and, and conquering both the nation of Israel and Jerusalem. The Babylonians and the Assyrians, when, you know, when they come in and, and, and take over. And Jeremiah is telling the people, God is not happy 
you need to repent of your sins and return to him. The problem is, is that Jeremiah had some competition. There were other pat, uh, prophets who were saying, oh, no, 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 that's not right. God is pleased with us. We have peace, 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 peace. And Jeremiah is yelling at them, saying, why are you declaring peace when there is no peace? But Pastor Dave, it makes people feel good to tell them that God loves them. Well, that's true. But that's not the whole truth. Is that God wants to shower his saving love on them, but that does not come automatically. Jesus came to bring peace. We can't accept the peace. We can't live in that peace if we don't recognize that there already exists the conflict and we are part of it. Well, Pastor Dave, that doesn't make me feel good. I don't want to hear about conflict. Well, no, I don't either. And I can't imagine Jesus being very, you know, keen on this either, because if you ever noticed, if you've ever actually tried to break up a fight, if you ever tried to mediate between two parties, guess who usually gets hurt the most? There's a great scene. I, I love the movie, A River Runs Through It. Have you ever seen that movie? It's a great movie about fishing in Montana. It's just it's beautiful. About two young, two young boys coming of age in Montana, and they did something that young boys, brothers especially, will, are want to do. They did something really, really stupid. And the problem is they lived to tell it. And then they got in trouble for it. And then, you know, when they're alone, they're like, oh, gee, wasn't that great? And then the one brother gets mad at the other because he realizes, no, that wasn't really great. That was really stupid. We could have died. And you're sitting here smiling about it. And they start fighting with each other. And then their mother comes in to break up the fight. And what happens? Mom gets knocked down. Right? The mediator, the one in the middle, is usually the one who takes the brunt. I talked about marriage counseling sometimes. You know, this happens too. You know, husband and wife come in, they're, they're both equally, you know, probably guilty. All right? And so if I say to the one, you know, say, okay, well, Jim, you know, you, you're doing some things here. You probably shouldn't be doing that. You should be doing this instead. And you know, I go to Sally and say, you know, Sally, you, you're, you're doing this. And, you know, you should probably be doing this instead. You know, when they walk out, you know, they're going to be like, you see what the preacher told you to do? All right? We don't hear what he says. We hear what he said to the other one because we're actually mad at him for whatever he said to us. The person in the middle is usually the one who takes the heat. And so what does Jesus come to do? This is why the crucifixion of Christ is so vital to Christianity. What is Jesus doing on the cross? Well, he's caught in the middle of a war. The earthly people that he comes to save they betray him, they walk out on him, they say, crucify him, we don't want your help. We're doing just fine on our own, and you deserve to die. And then on the cross, the Father pours out his wrath and his anger on sin, on 
his own son. And there Jesus hangs, caught in the middle between heaven and earth. But Paul tells us in Romans, in Christ we have peace with God. It's the only way it can come. It's through Jesus Christ. And for us to have faith in Christ, we have faith in what he did for us on the cross. He was the mediator. He was the go-between. He took the full fury of humankind and he took the full fury of God's wrath towards sin so that we would have a way to approach God from a position of peace. Now here's the thing. The mediator gets all the credit. We were on one side of the war. We can't forget that. God was on the other side. But the reason that Paul can say that Jesus came to have a ministry of reconciliation is that he's bringing together two sides that were at war. So being a Christian really means this. I give up. I'm done fighting. I accept the terms of peace. And what do those terms look like? Well, think about the story of the prodigal son. I said this morning, I don't like the term prodigal son because most of us think that the term prodigal means wayward. It doesn't. It means someone who is outlandishly spending. So when the son, you know, takes his inheritance, leaves his father's house, what does he do? He goes and he spends it on on wild living. That's being a prodigal. It's spending lavishly on things. And so what happens when the son does this? Eventually, he runs out. And oh, by the way, in order to get your dad's inheritance early, you got to say, Dad, I wish you were dead now. You see the war, the conflict that happens. He goes off and he does his own thing. But what's the dad doing all the time? He's watching for the return of his son. When the money runs out and the son is at the bottom of a pigsty, he surrenders and says, you know what, I, I don't want this conflict to last any longer. I'm going to go and I'm going to offer my father terms of peace. So he makes up in his mind to go and say, Dad, I've sinned against God and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Please treat me as one of your hired servants. That's his terms for peace. But the good news of Jesus Christ says... The Father rejects those terms. See, when the Father sees the Son coming, he hikes up his garments and he begins to run. People in that day did not run. If you were running, that meant you were in a hurry for something. It It was actually an embarrassment because to run, you'd have to hike up your garments and expose your legs. And that was shameful to do in that culture. But the father doesn't care because he's going to have his son back. The son who was at war with him is coming back and he's going to run to him and he throws his arms around him and the son begins to offer his terms and the father says none of that. And what happens? The father 
becomes the prodigal. Bring a robe and put it on him. Put sandals on his feet. Put a ring on his finger. Go and kill the fattened calf because we're going to celebrate. The father becomes the prodigal father at the return of the prodigal son. See, we don't get to dictate the terms of peace to God because we would be horrible at it. We would ask for far too little. We just want, you know, an end to the conflict, you know, if, if we've gotten to that low point in our lives. But what happens in the terms for peace is totally unfair. And if you're going to look at me and say, Pastor Dave, are you calling God unfair? Yes, I am. And I'm going to say, hallelujah, so should you. Because we come to the table with nothing but our sin, our guilt, for being at war with God because we wanted to be God instead. And God says, I'll take that. And in exchange, I'm not going to just lay down my arms and... and and forget that any of this ever happened and we go on living the same way. No, I'm going to bring you into the family. No, better yet, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at you as if you lived the life that Jesus lived. All of the good things that Jesus did, being perfectly poor in spirit, mourning over the sin, being meek, being hungry and thirst for righteousness, being merciful, being pure in heart, making peace with God. All of those characteristics, all of what Jesus built up in his heavenly bank account, God says, I'm going to put that into your spiritual account. As if it's yours. As if you did that. But you say, but I didn't do any of that. God says that's what grace is. G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. Christ paid the bill. And he says, if you accept my terms of peace, I will give you everything that I have. I will give you my status, I will give you my holiness, I will give you my satisfaction before the Father so that you can have peace with him. It is yours. But how can that be? I'm, I'm the bad guy in the story. I'm the, I'm the wayward, lavishly spending on junk son. And God says... We're going to roll out the fattened calf. And do it. George, how many people did your pig feed? How many people did your pig feed yesterday? Yeah. The fattened calf is going to feed more than that. We're going to spend and we're going to celebrate because we have peace. See, the true question for the Christian, the true way to Christ is saying whether or not we are willing to accept the terms of peace. Some of us, intellectually, we want the peace, but we don't want the surrender that goes with it. See, we want to keep being our own God, but we want the benefits that Jesus won on the cross too. And God says, you can't have Jesus and. If you want Jesus plus, you get nothing. But if all you want is Jesus, and you're willing to give up 
everything to get it. Then you have everything. That's what peace looks like. And without that peace, the next three verses become really, really hard. Jesus came so that we could have peace with God. But then we get to do something even better. We get to help others achieve that same peace. For those of you that helped me with the fair last month, maybe you heard it too. When people come to me and they talk about their tattoos, quite often, what I hear under those stories is, I'm looking for peace in my life. And this tattoo is a portion of that that's talking about there there was this conflict in my life and I'm searching for peace. And this picture speaks to that peace that I'm looking for. In building relationships with people, our goal, and sometimes this takes a while for people to come to that point of surrender, and we love them through the journey. But our goal is to get them to say, to be able to look at them and say, I know where you can find perfect peace. Because it's already been accomplished in what Jesus did for me. But we can't get to that spot until we've experienced it ourselves. Otherwise, we're going to be selling an imperfect peace. We don't really know peace at all. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. You see, I think God had, I think Jesus had the story of the wayward prodigal son in mind when he said this. Because when we come to the peace table, God comes to us and says, Welcome home, my son. Welcome home, my daughter. The war is over. We can have peace together. And I want to spend lavishly on you. That's the gospel. That's why we call it good news. But we can only understand the good news. We can only appreciate the peace if we know what the bad news is. If we know where the war is currently going on. But if you are in Christ, Paul says, we have peace. And that is huge. That is eternal. And that means the war is over. Amen. In response to God's word, would you join me as we affirm our faith by reciting the Apostles' Creed? Words are found in your bulletin or on the wall behind me. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, the life everlasting. Amen.
As we come before the Lord in prayer, are there any praises or prayer requests that we can lift before the family this morning? I would ask you to pray for me this week and uh, pray for Rose and the kids too. Uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday this week, I will be down in uh, Falls Church, Virginia, just outside of Washington, D.C. Um, we will be having our uh, national conference. It's called the Explorers Conference on Evangelism. Uh, this is uh, through the work that I do with Evangelize Today. And my friend Al Dayhoff, who wrote uh, the book Tattoos, Telling the Secrets of the Soul, is the head of that ministry. Um, many of you probably know he pastors a bar, a restaurant. It's a blues bar. They've got live music there most nights. It's a bar called JV's. Uh, and there's going to be about 20 pastors from all over the country uh, descending on that little restaurant Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday this week. That place may never be the same, and, and neither may we be the same. But we're going to have there's going to be three days of presentations uh, on what we've been learning uh, in the realm of discovery and evangelism. I'm going to be sharing on Thursday uh, a lot of what we did here between our uh, parade float, our booth at the fair, um, and what did we learn from that. I will also be... Uh, conducting a, a session at another time uh, with one of the ladies who went to Daytona with me for Bike Week back in March. If you can remember, that seems like that was forever ago. That was just earlier this year. Um, we're going to be talking about some things there. Um, if you are interested and would like to watch, uh, there, is, there is a registration fee, but it will be uh, live cast uh, all three days, I think, I think it's $100 for the three days. Um, if, if you would like that, I can get you more information for that. Uh, but that means uh, I'll be there and I won't be here. So please pray for Rose uh, as she uh, tries to handle all of the, the scheduling of the kids and her own job and, uh, and all that good stuff uh, while, I'm, while I'm away. So I appreciate your prayers for that. Any other Praises or prayer requests that we can bring this morning. All right. Well, let's take these and any unspoken requests that you have before the Lord in prayer this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ and for the peace that he has brought to us through his death and resurrection. Father, would you help us to live in light of that peace? Father, would you help us to be peacemakers and to lead others to that same peace that we know in Jesus Christ? Father, as we've come before you this morning and lifted our concerns before you, Father, we also ask that you would hear any concerns that remain upon our hearts. Father, for you know where the brokenness, the sickness, the sadness, the anxiety and the cares rest in each of us. Father, would you lift those from our hearts and bring all things in accordance with your perfect will. And give us your spirit of peace. Let it surround us and enfold us. Guide us and direct us to give us strength to serve and to live for you each day. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior who taught his disciples, and so us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. In response to God's word, would you say, stand for our closing hymn, My Jesus, I Love Thee. God's benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you now and forever. Amen.